Hey, hey, food explorers. Welcome so much to the episode today. I am delighted. I have two amazing guests that I have actually known for quite a few years now. Chris and Sherry Lynn Williams are people that I actually met when I was living in the Bow Valley. And for those of you that are longtime listeners, you know that I dearly miss the Bow Valley. Last week, we did a retrospective episode where I actually was back in Canmore, went to all my favorite places and showed people this is where I was at. But we did not go up to Engadine Lodge, which is actually where I met Chris and Sherry Lynn. So Chris and Sherry Lynn, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Colleen. Nice to be here. Nice to see you guys. Now, you are far, far away from me now. You've actually moved across the country and you are in Annapolis Valley, Nova Scotia. What what drew you to move from the east coast, the west coast to the east coast? Well, after we left um, the Rockies, we actually moved around a little bit after that. Um, we ended up going um, to PEI first for a few months. And then we off to Tuscany, Italy for a few months. Um, and then we were from there to California. Yeah. And we worked there for about two or three years. And then came home, and we were just trying to figure out where to settle in anywhere. And, and it, everything pointed towards Nova Scotia. I was born here. Yeah. Um, and it was just the perfect spot. We came out here and spent, what, a month? Yeah, we, we actually came out looking to buy a bed and breakfast out here. And we were going to make this our final stopping place. And one of the reasons we're out east was because the price of real estate was affordable for us. You work in the hospitality industry, you don't make a ton of money, so... It was one of the places we could afford. Ended up not finding a B and B that we liked enough. We've been a little spoiled at all the locations where we work, and so we ended up buying a really tiny old farm home, and uh, we could afford it. So hence, here we are. And we we really lucked into the location where we live. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. we're just you know just outside of Annapolis Royal called Round Hill, and it's just it's magic here, just pure magic. I we love it. I literally, I look at your photos every time you post and I'm like, why don't I live in Nova Scotia? <laughs> and it's true. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> it's, it's hard because, you know, when you're trying to find somewhere that's kind of your final place. And I know you guys, so you, we met at Mount Engadine Lodge, which is a beautiful lodge in the Canadian Rockies, just uh, up in the Spray Lakes behind Canmore. And honestly, it was the two of you that made that place so special for me. I I used to come there every weekend. I brought my dearly departed dog, Chewy, with me. And That's we true. loved it. And then my parents would come. And mm -hmm. so I can understand, like, going from a place like that, it's like, well, how do you, how do you find something else that you really love? But also... Being um, innkeepers, that's, I mean, you talked about hospitality industry. What, you know, from your time in the hospitality industry, what are some of the things that, you know, are just takeaways that you're like, I'm so glad I got to do that? I think for us, it was just the fortunate part of, we both had that sort of zest for travel and we didn't have any sort of restrictions. Um, so whenever we'd get a new job offer, especially when we first got into the industry back in the mid 90s, we were getting a lot of job offers, and um, I would just look at Sherry Lynn and sort of say, do you feel like moving here? And we'd go, yeah, let's move there. And we'd go there for six months or a year or two years, depending on the property and depending on their needs. Um, but it was the fortunate part for us. We got the chance to meet a lot of amazing people and that we still have long-term friendships with. Since we've been out here in Nova Scotia, we've had a number of guests of ours from Mount Engadine Lodge, for example, who had stopped in here to visit with us out here, um, which is lovely. It's, it's a great industry. Our situation is kind of odd because most people can't work and play together uh, 24-7. We were pretty good at it. Um, and so that provided us with a lot of opportunities. Yeah. yeah. And there is a lot of couples. I work with my sweetie, but everybody knows that if he's murdered, he's going to be in the compost bin out back. Like everybody knows where he's going. <laughs> we, we have days where we are challenged to be together. But uh, for the most part, though, he is... He's great because, uh, I mean, having that person that is with you that also understands the, the job that you're doing. And um, we were still in the hospitality industry here. Um, I teach hospitality now. Um, mm -hmm. I actually teach on reserve quite often. I'm teaching in less than a month. I'm heading back to reserve and I'm teaching uh, a grassroots indigenous community focused course all about building a hospitality industry. And so hospitality for me, for you guys, I mean, it's just, it's kind of what we do yeah. and we yeah. love it. Now yeah. where you're at, um, you have an amazing garden and I wanted to just 
touch on that just quickly for a second here. When you bought the house, was that something that you looked at? Was being able to have a big garden? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, we, we, we fell in love with the place initially because Sherilyn said it was a really great price, which it was. I mean, we bought this house. It was built in 1870. And uh, we wow. bought this place for 86000 when we bought it. Um, it's now worth considerably more than that. But we just like the location. Yeah. Uh, and our views, from, you're off the side yard. We're looking over the Annapolis River. We've got the North Mountain in the background. Um, it's just a really great area and handy to Annapolis Royal Short. So and Bridgetown's not far away either. So the gardens were always something we wanted to play in, but never to the extent we have now. We really put them in because Chris was sick of cutting grass. So in order, and we're only on just over half an acre. Yep. So our house was the original farmhouse of several hundred acres, and the house ended up with just half an acre in the end. But he hated cutting. Well, didn't hate, but it took so much time. We were like, well, let's just keep putting in gardens, less to cut, and then also provides us with food. So, yeah, that's kind of it. Kept evolving from there. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it started off as a small little plot, and now, of course, the new garden we got that we put in two years ago is the first year we're really using it. Is sixty by thirty. Um, so it's a big garden. That's amazing. Yeah. And I I saw like you the tomatoes that are coming out of your garden right now. I feel like you have your own little tomato production facility. <laughs> Some through the screen. Yeah. It um what we sort of we started off the front part of the garden with certain plants and that worked out good for us. And then we had a bunch of seedlings left over and I said to Sherry Lynn, we should just throw those in. I don't think they're gonna live. So let's put them in. Well that's the jungle area in the back now. We haven't even Touch back there um, where the tomatoes are. Yeah. Our tomatoes plants in front. We have three small cherry tomato plants. I shouldn't say small, but the three. Plants are big. The plants are big, but we didn't expect to have that much stuff come off them. But we've had almost fifteen hundred cherry tomatoes in the last three weeks. Off. And they're still giving her. Yeah. They're still giving. Her. When you start doing the math, you're like fifteen hundred cherry tomatoes divided by a pint of tomatoes. I just saved myself like ten thousand dollars. <laughs> well, and that was part of it too. I mean, we we went into full retirement in June. And part of it was sort of making ourselves more um, self-reliant with what we have here in our own backyard. Everything grows really well out in this area. The soil is good. You just have to do some work with it. And so part of it was sort of how can we cut some of our costs down? I mean, we haven't bought a head of garlic um, in probably five years um, because we've been doing our own garlic for five years now. And this year was the first year in the new garden um, that we put a lot of you know manure into and everything. We're getting massive garlic this year, and I'm just so excited. Um, everything's coming out phenomenal. And is the growing season, like compared to the Rockies, growing season longer, different? Long. Super long, actually. Um, it's we, get, we can start growing. I mean, typically you have to wait till after the first frost, where the rule is down here, is after the... First full moon in June. First full moon in June is typically the rule um, down here for when you plant, so you can avoid frosts. Now, this yeah. year, everything was very, very early. So we had everything in probably mid-May because it was just, you just couldn't see any frost situations. And then the growing season this year has been phenomenal, especially for the fruit growers out here. I mean, the apple trees, the vines, everything that's growing is just crazy. You can't, it's hard to do anything wrong at this point in time unless you just complete disregard to the garden. We typically right. get our, our first fall frost around the end of September. So it's, it's a pretty good growing season, you know, and you can obviously get some crops in before the June frost, like if there's still frost. So yeah, it's, it's amazing how much this valley is protected by the mountains and what the growing season is out here and what they can grow. I mean, nectarines, peaches, grapes. I mean, there's a lot of tender fruit out here, and it, it surprises a lot of people. So you're like, well, you're way over in Nova Scotia. How can you be doing that? But, I think yeah. it's also yeah, the Nova Valley, and its location is also in that perfect, it's almost like the Niagara Valley um, in Ontario, where it's got a big mm -hmm. body of water um, on one side, which is the Bay of Fundy. And then you've got the North Mountain, which really isn't a mountain, as we would know mountains from the Rockies. But it's it's an escarpment, basically. Um, but the amount of fog and everything that rolls into this valley keeps everything very lush and very moist. Um, it's just a beautiful area to drive through with farms everywhere. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, when they think of things like what you're saying, Sherry Lynn, peaches and nectarines, they just think BC fruit, right? They're, yeah. they're not thinking Nova Scotia fruit. Exactly. <laughs> when I moved here and I was like oh my goodness this all grows here because I didn't know Nova Scotia as well I'd been once when I was a little kid but yeah it's just you drive through that valley and the further up valley you go from us the bigger the orchards get the more numerous and the variety just keeps increasing it's it's beautiful yeah in our area down here the valley sort of two different areas the 
eastern edge of the valley, which would be Wolfville area, um, Berwick, Aylesford, those areas, uh, more commercial farms out there. Um, our area down here is all small uh, mom and pop farms, typically. I mean, our farmer's market here on Saturdays um, in the Market Square in downtown Annapolis Royal typically has 100 to 125 booths out there. And it's just phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, obviously, I'm I'm still in Alberta. I'm moving soon. Trust me. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I can't afford it anymore. <laughs> Going to Portugal. You guys want to come? No. <laughs> well, well, see, we were just there last September. It was awesome. I love Portugal. And they, and they have digital nomad visas. I can be an expat there. I mean, but it's interesting because we do not see, like, you've got this Nova Scotia produce. We don't see it in the grocery stores here. We see Mexico. We see California. Yep. Yep. So it's very frustrating with our food system where, you know, we've got these places like where you're at that have these growing seasons that basically make it so that you can do some of these stone fruits that are, yep. like you said, they're those softer ones, but yet they don't come to this side of Canada. And I wonder if part of it is just transportation. It's easier to bring it from Mexico. Probably. I think it's a combination of that, but it's also a combination of probably uh, interprovincial agreements. I mean, uh, for example, in Alberta, they probably have an agreement with BC that they carry most of their fruits. So I can see where some of that would go back and forth in the um, governments and on the provincial level. Yeah. And yeah. We may not be quite big enough, some of our, even though we have large form, farms and orchards, they may not be quite big enough. So they supply a lot of the Maritimes. And we have the same thing. I mean, I was in our grocery store today and you know, the uh, strawberries they're selling are from the States. And we still have strawberries going here right now. Not the huge crops, but we still have some. So we get our produce in the grocery store at times, but typically it's, it's you know, from abroad. It's also how you buy. I mean, we're fortunate here. We don't spend a lot of money in the grocery store itself. Um, you know, we buy farmer's markets, farm side tables. I mean, there's farm side tables. We're on the Highway 201. And between us and the end of the 201, there's probably... 30 to 40 farm side tables, whatever's in season at the time, people are selling it inexpensively. Um, so we don't buy a lot in the grocery stores. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's funny you talk about the BC produce and a memory just came back when we were at Engadine Lodge. And I think in the last couple of years, we were there trying to get produce. You're relying on like the big companies like Cisco and that to deliver to us. And you had to hope it was good when it arrived. And uh, then that truck started showing up from BC. Yeah. The guy would show up in the summer with all of the produce that was in season from BC, and we would go in early in the morning into Canmore. He'd be in some parking lot somewhere, and we would be able to buy like flats of peaches, nectarines, and whatever else. It was like uh, it made the summer so beautiful. We had such great produce coming up at at the lodge, and people would be like, "Seriously?" We're like, "Yeah, it's working." Yeah, was that Stephen Dan's? I can't remember to be very honest. And yeah. it was sort of a one off sort of thing that we'd seen. It was the first time we'd seen it. Um, but okay. I don't remember the name per se. So yeah. yeah, and we have we we're at the farmers markets every weekend. So Jason and I, that's our thing. We go to a minimum of two every weekend. Mostly it's just to gossip with our friends, but you know, and then yeah. buy whatever we need. But we love being able to support those local vendors because they're, you know, it just it keeps all the money in the community. And I don't need yeah. to support this giant conglomerate that's not putting up food that's necessarily the best for me. I can support my friend and exactly. I know what I'm getting. Yeah. Um, now, with you guys, so, I mean, those farm fruit stands and, and vegetable stands, are. I lived in Niagara for a while. And yeah, you just drive along those back highways and you're like, oh, look at this. Oh, look at this. Yeah. I made a lot of cherry pies when I lived in Niagara. <laughs> there was just so many species of cherries. but. It's such a good, it's a local economy, but also are you finding with some of these smaller farmers, like they can support or provide to local restaurants? Like, is there, is there a little bit of that that happens? Huge here. Actually, it's funny. You go to one of our favorite stands in um, Annapolis Royal is Stratton Farms. And it's a British couple um, that opened up this farm back about four or five years ago, I guess. Maybe a little bit longer. Um, but you get there first thing in the morning when the market opens up at nine. But they've already got bags and boxes in behind them that are for all the local restaurants um, they're providing. Them. And that's the big thing here. It's like, you know, I'm a, I worked in one of the top restaurants in the area here for a while and used to buy all of our stuff from local farmers. And the farmers would show up at our back door at the restaurant with the greens, like Whipple Tree Farms yeah. would show up with all the greens. And then Sisabu Organics came in with all their microgreens. 
Um, yeah, we've got a local butcher, for example, over in Bridgetown who carries nothing but Nova Scotia meat. Um, it's unbelievable. It's yeah. really a very local focus. Yeah, and they'll grow what the restaurants want too. Sometimes, like the restaurant that Chris worked at, it, Founders House, incredible restaurant. The chef would go and talk with Stratton Farms or a couple other farmers and say, "Are you able to grow these types of things?" And they're like, "Yeah, let us give it a whirl." And I swear, Strattons—they can grow anything, anywhere. Like they're incredible. We tried a lot of new stuff from them that I'd never even heard of before, um, like some of their those peppers. I can't remember the name of those peppers that we get, but they're like a wrapped around, almost like a, a weaving basket around the whole outside of them. And we dry them out usually for two or three months, then grind them down, and that's our chili peppers for top of pastas and all that kind of stuff. But it just they carry so many unique things. It's phenomenal. Yeah, and we have a we have a new farmer here that we absolutely love, and same thing like. We went the other day and we got Mizuna and neither of us had ever heard of it before. We yep. went yeah. over to one of our local restaurants, talking to the ladies there. And we're like, yeah, we got this thing called Mizuna. Well, they're all Japanese. They lost their minds. They're like, what? And we're, yep. we're like, whoa, okay, here, take it, take it. <laughs> you know, but well, for them, for it was, that's a green they eat all the time. So then they were like, oh, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. And, and so we, we, we divided up the package with them. But when we go to Thistle Hill, they always have something new. We last year they had five species of radishes. I yeah. had oh. seen red radishes before. They had yeah. green ones, black ones, rainbow. I was just like, and what are all these. Yeah. yeah, I know. And it, that's what it was like. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. All the green thumbs. They have all the green. I do not have the green thumbs. <laughs> I can well, make chocolate this year just a little bit only for the fact that I've got good soil but that's the only reason because we everything we've tried to eat before we had success but never great success but we took I said if we're going to do this big garden up in our property let's do it up properly so it was horse manure is a big thing out here we use that two years in a row and it has to be two-year-old horse manure to make it proper um but it's just all those little extra adds, and I put in winter rye yeah um, so into the whole garden to loosen the soil because we do get a bit of clay out here so I planted winter rye throughout the garden and left that through winter and then cut that and turn that into the soil, and that made the soil very loose, very loamy, beautiful. So you just took the rye, cut it down, and then put it back into the soil? Yep, cut the top stuff off, threw that away. You can actually use that if you wanted to. I didn't have a purpose for it, but you could have used that to make a flour or something like that if you wanted. I'm more used it into beers as well. But I took the top stuff off and then turned all the rest of the roots right into the soil, took the rotor tiller down and moved it back in. But it made the soil amazing. That's that's incredible. I saw on one of your pictures you did some uh, compound garlic scape butter. I yeah. also just yeah. made some of that, <laughs> and I, I put it out. And Jason was like, "What's this?" I'm like, "I made some compound butter." It drives him nuts because I never I don't make anything at home, and then suddenly I'll be like, "Oh, here I made this," and he's just like, "Why are you holding out on me?" <laughs> yeah. it's, but you guys it's made so a lot. Yeah, it's so simple things yeah. you can do. I mean, we've done a bunch of compound butters um, throughout the season. We're trying to use more and more like this year we also did for example in our sage right you did i did sage pesto sage. Uh, yeah sage flower pesto and i just kept saying to sure then we have this huge sage bush out there that's got so much stuff on it there's got to be something we can do with this other than just using the sage for the spice and that's when i read about the sage uh, petal pesto it's hard to say all the time but you just had to literally take the little paper bottoms and you pull the flower out of the top you collect those until you get about two cups and then you use that just to make a regular pesto with your nuts garlic um basil and all that kind of stuff so yeah lovely stuff oh that's amazing we just um we got a bag of we have a, another farmer that we buy from golby farms and we got a big bag of sage but we mm -hmm. fry it up in chicken yeah. grease and salt it and just eat it yeah it's so <laughs> good yeah so good i yeah. love it so much now the garlic that you grew. So my understanding is garlic is kind of a challenge. And you guys, now, how many years have you done garlic for? Well, this we've done for five years now. It's it's a challenge for the first couple of years um, because you really need to, it's your seed garlic is the most important thing. Whatever you're planting is the sting. And a lot of people just take regular garlic from the store and plant it in, and that'll work for you. But in order to really get the big garlic that most people are striving for, it takes about three years. And yeah. last year was the first year that I started to see some good sizes. But of course, then you take... Like this year, I had about 140 heads of garlic, and I take the top, I take 20% of whatever I grow, and I save that for the seed garlic for the next year. So if I got roughly, it was about 30 this year, I think I saved, um, and each one of those heads gives me about six cloves, so I should be planting roughly 150 to 180 heads of garlic this year. 
Um, and but you're taking the best of the best from this year, so that should make your garlic next year even better. And that's what's happening. We had so yeah. many big garlic this year. It's just it's lovely. It's a lovely treat. And what are you? What's your? Are you preserving it or just storing it for later? We mostly store it for later. Um, we we cure it down properly. We hang it up to dry and then store it in a dark spot and the right you know keep it nice and dry. Um, but we use it. Some people say it only lasts for six to seven months, and ours tends to last all year long. If we have smaller ones, we'll, for example, make up um, uh, pickled garlic. Um, we'll take the small ones if, um, and just peel them all off, share them in the batch. I just poach some. Yeah. Actually poach some of the small ones in olive oil so that we have that in the fridge. And then uh, my friend down the road makes her own tome, uh, the garlic paste. So she's going to let me know how she do- does that. And I want to have a jar of tome in the fridge, too, because that's like garlic on steroids. Yeah. You know, yes, that's our, so good. Well, our friend down the road. We have our little garlic, our little garden here, but our friends down the road, Chantel and Gary, um, they live off the grid. So I think this year they had 6,000 garlic plants. Um, it's <laughs> it's when you go up to their place, it's just Disneyland for foodies. It's just stuff oh, everywhere. Lord. They've got, you know, the raspberry shoots over here and the, or the canes. They got uh, blueberries, blackberries, currants. Um, yeah, even like this year with our current, we've had a small current bush that was at the property when we bought it. Yeah, and for some reason it just gives a ton of fruit every year, and so with that every year we end up doing a lot of different stuff. I've done uh, red currant gin. Um, we've done up. Um, we do uh, currant bars. We've done jellies. You know, just whatever we can vinegar. We've yeah, done a red currant vinegar. So yeah. and we use the red currant vinegar. That's where it's our main vinegar that we're using this summer for all of our salads, and it's from our own fruit. And our chive blossom vinegar. Yeah. yeah. Oh. That's amazing. I um I have a friend that has a very small little acreage and I got currants from her. And yeah. I just this year I'd frozen most of them and I'd just been using them, but this year I made a big batch of syrup. Oh, and yeah. it was just it was so easy. You you put it in with the sugar, you boil it for a couple of minutes, you strain it off, you got syrup. And you oh. can leave them on the stems too when you're making that kind of stuff because you're going to strain it. So it's like yeah, you don't have to pick through them as much. Yeah, most people don't late. realize just most people don't realize just how much stuff is sitting in their own back gardens that they can use for so many different things, like the vinegars and all that kind of stuff, like the butters. You can do so simple things to enhance daily product to make it really yeah. special, and make it your own. Yeah, there's something about in the winter doing like a whole chicken in the oven and slipping your own compound butter under the skin with all the herbs and that, and it's like it just takes it to a next level. Yeah, yeah. I'm drooling. I love that. We, um, Jason, I, when I say we, when it's cooking, it's Jason. It's not me. Um, yep. he, he does the spatchcock chicken. Okay, and so yep. he puts the oven on broil, but he puts the chicken on the lowest rack and cooks it like yep. that. And he cook a whole chicken in like 40 minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's work. amazing. Yeah, it's whole nights. So we in the kitchen for us. It's, it's like tonight's my night to cook. Last night was Sherry Lynn's night. But we alternate it. It's your night to cook. You also clean. So it's none of that. If your cook's a real messy cook, you're on your own. Um, so it's you do your own thing, but we just love it because it's part of we both love to cook so much that we're always doing some really amazing dishes. So it's fun, fun kitchen to eat in. Yeah, and it's nice too because it's you know you can actually look at that item and be like, oh, I got this from my friend down the road. Oh, I got this from my garden. And Jason and I were walking in our neighborhood the other day, and there was a huge apple tree, and all the apples were on the ground, and the people that lived there, like I don't know. They just, they left them all. They're not even touching them. And we see wow. rhubarb plants all the time. And I'm like, oh, do something with it. Yeah. yeah Cause it's just, I yeah. mean, now that was the other question I had for you. Do you have, um, so like here we have companies that if you say maybe you're elderly or you don't have time and you can't pick the fruit in your yard, they'll go pick it and make it into jams to sell it. You guys have companies like that out there that do those kinds of services? Um, not to go onto your own property typically and to harvest and produce something. I mean, other than it's local friends. I mean, our, our friend Chantel, for example, yes, if someone's got a lot of bounty of something at their place, she'll be happy to go pick it from their place, make up something for herself as well, but also to give some back to them. Uh, but not a service per se. Um, there might be something at Valley, but yeah, nothing yeah. I've heard of here. Not locally here, no. Yeah. An yeah. And it's, it's kind lot. of a nice thing because, you know, if you have somebody that is elderly and they're like, I'm not climbing that apple tree. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, you can climb it, and then you could do something with it. <laughs> well, the same thing this year. Our neighbor across the road, actually, her husband unfortunately passed away last fall, and she's got some beautiful fruit trees, but she's got the house up for sale and is moving. And it was just a shame that she didn't look after her trees this year, which she normally has done every year. 
and we were just looking, watching the fruit going oh, just yeah the peaches rotting. were rotting on the tree because they hadn't been taken care of so we were yeah. like oh but she yeah. had a few other things on her mind yeah <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely i just um finished dog sitting and she had sour cherry tree and mm-hmm. I came home with a couple bags of sour cherries because I was like, I will go out and pick these cherries. But my last day of picking the, you know, the black wasps with the white butts, the really mean ones. Yeah, yeah they. I was like, no, I'm I'm done. You can you have, them. Can have the cherries. We actually this year, we have a sour cherry tree on our property here that's never produced fruit until this year. And like I said, this year has been a kind of a crazy year for mm-hmm. all fruit trees and everything down here. But all of a sudden I looked up and I thought, that it looks like cherries up in that tree and it's just never done fruit it just hasn't formed well but that same thing this year i was up there with a ladder getting up into the branches and i was pulling down we pulled out probably four or five quarts of um sour cherries and the two boys that live next door were over all the day every time they come over to run over to play at our place they'd be on the ground grabbing all the ones that had dropped down um and eating those but yeah they love our coming over here our red currant bush same thing we grow a lot of mint on the deck to keep the bugs away and um, so they like to grab leaves of the mint and then run around to the red currant bush, red currants in the middle, and they make them little sandwiches, they call them. So, Oh, my goodness. That is so – and it's great. Like, when kids get involved and kids are actually out doing, my niece is such a little foodie. She's so great. But she will – she'll try anything, too. She's just 10. But, yep. you know, if you've got something new, she, even if she doesn't like it, she'll try it. And it should be like, nope, I don't yep. like it. Yeah. But she'll try well, it. The third thing over here has been our Korean uh, licorice mint. Yeah. Um, they've really been enjoying that. Delicious. What is that? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's amazing. It's a regular mint plant, but when you chew it, the licorice finish on it is unbelievable. It's, and the leaves are a different shape, too. They're a little bit broader. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's and they're softer leaves. So, yeah, these kids got addicted to it, so their mom had to go buy one of the plants to grow it at home because they ate all of ours last year. I was like, okay, you got to stop. The plant's got to live. <laughs> Please yeah, don't harvest go. all of it. Yeah, I think we've got spearmint, peppermint, the Korean mint, and black mint, and black mint out there right now on our on our deck. So I just pop the pots back in the ground and let them winter, and then I pull them back out and put them back up on the deck. So that's awesome. it's been so working. Now, well. when will you have to your garlic? When will that go into the ground then? Uh, usually, probably sometime in October. It's got to go in before the first frost. And we okay. typically don't get the first big frost here until, and we can get frost as early as like Sharon said earlier, late September, or early October. But typically, most people aren't planting their garlic until the end of October. Um, and then it'll come into, it'll start coming up in usually April. And then we harvest the scapes typically in end of May, early June. And then harvest the garlic itself usually at the end of June once the leaves have dropped down. June, July. Yeah, June, early July. Yeah. Nice. And you guys did a whole bunch. Of, so you did the compound butter with your scapes. And then what else did you do with your scapes? Um, wow. I think you pickled a few. We had yep. some pickled ones. Um, we gave some away to people. We had so many of them. And yep. we, we don't eat tons of scapes. Yeah, the scapes are so much. I mean, there's you, the problem is it's a crop that comes in all at one time. So I did uh, freezing a bunch down. We'll use that for soups and stews. So we chopped a bunch of that up into, we bought ourselves a stand-up freezer this year, specifically because of the big garden. Um, that we just, we were, last year we made up a whole bunch of tomato sauces and everything for the winter. And about end of February or mid-February, we were out of everything. Yeah. And we just sort of said, we want to do it better next year. So that's when the bigger garden got the freezer. But yeah, so we took a lot of the garlic skate, chopped them up, flash froze them. Um, so we'll use those later. Um, the garlic skate butter we did up. And then some of the local restaurants in town too. We, we know all the chefs in the area. And so I'll reach out to some of the chefs and say, hey, I've got, hundred garlic scapes here. Do you want any of the garlic scapes? And we pass them on to them. Cake. Yeah. And it's a nice yeah. trade off. We'll go in there and drop off and the last time I did that down at Whiskey Deller last year, dropped off a bunch of garlic scapes and I got a, a drink and a little snack on the side. So that's perfect. I actually I have written down in my notes here, how big is your freezer? <laughs> I was like, I don't have a big freezer for all the yeah. stuff. Um, we only that's a perfect a- takeaway though. Yes. Yeah. We've only ever had the fridge freezer the longest time. And that's yeah. sufficed for us because, of course, having a local butcher, you're like, we don't buy a lot of stuff in bulk. And we don't buy a right. lot of processed, hardly any processed food at all. So for us, our freezer, we have to strategize and sort of go, okay, we can't buy any more. Don't buy a whole chicken. We got room in the freezer right now. Um, because with all the butters and all that kind of stuff we put in, yeah. especially with Sherry's berries, because we do up a lot of berries down here for her because she does her yogurt and granola all, all year long. And so you can get the fruit down here really cheap at the Pickums. And we were getting like seven quarts for 
10 or 11 dollars 10 or 11 dollars at blueberries at so. blueberries so you go pick them for half an hour but then she's got all her blueberries she needs for the next year yeah. um same with strawberries we don't went to a you pick them strawberry place and pick up enough uh for the next year as well too so it's all those little things that you're not spending six seven eight dollars in the middle of winter for you know about premium for those kind of fruits so we've got them all in our freezer now so. yeah we bought yeah. a stand-up freezer it's only 11.5 cubic so it's not huge we didn't want anything too too big um but it'll be enough for us between the fridge freezer and that one and it just fit underneath our stairs which was we don't have a lot of room in the house <laughs> yeah so the um the little tiny things that you get a fruit now the little itty bitty ones here yeah. they're nine plus dollars for a little tiny one we actually haven't bought any fruit at all this year but i got from dog sitting i got two three bags of sour cherries i got rhubarb and then I actually went to a U-Pick out near Bittern Lake. So it's sort of mm -hmm. central Alberta. Really cool U-Pick for Saskatoons. And he had three cultivars there. So we had Smokies, North Lines, and uh, what was the other one? He had a third one. And uh, Honey, Honey Bush, Honey Wood. I wow. just went, I just kept going and picking. And he, on the last time I was there, he was like, just take the bag. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> I was like, okay, but I did, we did a whole Substack article about him. So he was thrilled because I did an article and we did the podcast and had him on the podcast and stuff. But it was really interesting because it was just this little farm that originally did not have Saskatoons. It was your typical Alberta farm, wheat, canola. Uh, him and his wife, when they took it over 30 something years ago, turned it into Saskatoons. And now they have these beautiful Saskatoons and, mm -hmm. um, and they're open for like 10 days. Saskatoon season is so short. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, it's been, it's been like you said, you know, the farm stands and all the you pick out here, like apple season is coming into full gear right now out here. And the you pick out here are phenomenal and very inexpensive as well, too. So we'll be doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was in this year's the first time I did uh, pick my own strawberries. So we have our little niece living down here now, great niece. And, uh, so she's four years old almost. So we took her out. She was a great little picker. She actually did very well. She ate a lot, but she did pretty good too. And so I have a bunch of strawberries now in my freezer too. I found this recipe for strawberry scones that I absolutely love. So oh, that's, that's my window. You know, Sunday morning you get up, you want something sweet, nice with your coffee. It'll be a strawberry scone. Yeah. And it, it's those little things where, you know, it's you get to make something, but then also you're spending time with a family member. And that's just, yeah. it's so precious. And yeah. so uh, when, now when did they move? So to, are they right two near years. you guys? Uh, yeah, very close. Actually, they moved two years ago. They were from, um, it's our oldest nephew, Justin. And um, him and his wife, Beth, and their daughter, Rebecca, they were living in Hamilton, not enjoying it. Um, and just need to change the pace. And it was actually this past weekend, two years ago, um, that they came down for a quick visit. And three weeks later, they bought a house. And they live about 15 minutes away from us. And it's just this is the first time for us in 25 years having family close. And it's been really, it's, it's changed for us, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it's been a wonderful change. And watching Rebecca grow up has been our biggest treat. Yeah. So we wanted to introduce her to you pick so that every year we'll have that tradition. And then as she gets older, we'll, you know, she'll cook with us too. And, you know, just carry on that tradition. She loves to be outside. So it's perfect. She's just an yeah. outdoors kid. Yeah. 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 She's developed into a great um, kid for Nova Scotia. And the kids down here, just aren't as glued into all their toys and machines like everybody else is in the big cities. Um, all, most of the kids are outside doing stuff that are climbing trees and, you know, running around the yards and that kind of stuff. It's, it's lovely to see. Yeah, I love it. My niece, she's really cute. I bought her when she was about four. I bought her a kid's cookbook and she Good. uses it. She'll, she'll pull it. She's 10 now. She'll pull it out though and she'll be like, okay, I would like to make this today. And my brother and my sister-in-law are awesome. They're like, yep. And they, they made like a chocolate loaf bread the other day it looked like a big sourdough loaf yeah and uh, i was like that's amazing <laughs> like they make chocolate babka and they do all the braiding and i'm just like oh my goodness you guys but she loves it and she's you know she's one of those kids that's like she doesn't have a phone obviously she's too young but it's yeah. nice because she actually wants to be in the kitchen and my brother and my sister-in-law are like, yeah, let's, let's do kitchen stuff. And then, you know, if grandma meow meow is there, or that's my mom, she's grandma meow meow. 
um <laughs> or if the other grandma there she's she's grandma pie because she makes pies uh, <laughs> you gotta, gotta, gotta have your distinctions of who's who <laughs> in the world right. yeah now um talking about local restaurants you guys when you do go out you're going to some of these fantastic local restaurants so the people that are you know some of your favorite restaurant tours in the area are they from nova scotia or they you know came because of the food culture or a little bit of both combination of both actually um when i look at we have a thistle group in the area which owns two or three restaurants um unfortunately whiskey teller which is their sort of premier one in downtown annapolis world burned down about a year ago wow. and they're just going through the fix up of that that's going to be reopening up in the next um probably month hopefully yeah hopefully. um but it was an old century building so we need a lot of work inside but they've, for example, they've brought in some chefs, but they've also had a lot of local chefs sort of be support people behind them on the sort of bigger chef. And then in time, they've taken over the role as the head chef. For example, the head chef over at Junction 16, which is a local wood-fired pizza and fresh pasta place. Um, Kylie, she's a local girl from here. Um, she's in her probably mid-20s. And she started off as a, just sort of a, a prep fairy, you know, in the back of the kitchen over at Founder's House. And over the last few years, it developed into a fabulous young chef. So it's a mix of both. But I think when chefs come down here from away, for the lack of better terms, um, they come down here and they see the bounty of goods. And they just cannot believe it. Uh, because it is similar to BC. It's similar to the Niagara region. Um, and most people don't realize that out here. I mean, like you go to Cape Breton on the east side of Nova Scotia, it's beautiful. And they do have some good growing out there as well, too. But their season is really, really short. It's like maybe two two and a half months um so it's you can't do much in that situation but out here the chefs come here and they meet all the farmers and they see the bounty and the beauty of the area and it's yeah there's a lot of chefs wanting to come here that's fantastic and that's a nice draw like that you have such a variety of food and like you said earlier you have farmers that are willing to be like what would you like me to grow i can do that for you mm -hmm. and that's a big difference and i one of the restaurants that i used to work at we would get food from local producers and when i would talk to chefs at other restaurants i'd be like oh my gosh we got this amazing you know we got nasturtiums or we got this and they'd be like from cisco i was like no not from cisco <laughs> and and but for them they were like no if i can't have you know the same thing every time and this many boxes of it i'm not gonna do it and I had one friend that actually came up with this incredible line of spices, small batch. You know, she was only buying, you know, little bits from the people growing the spices. The spices were always fresh. Mm -hmm. And the chefs were like, oh, the spices are really potent. I can't, I can't change my recipes to accommodate this. I don't want your product. I'd rather just buy from Costco. And she was just like, really? Really? Yeah. And so I'm looking, I'm looking at my, I got lots of bags here because I'm like, oh, I'll use them. <laughs> Like, I'm beholden to nobody with the chocolate business. But it's so interesting that there are some chefs that won't take a chance on a seasonally grown product. Yeah, well, I think it depends on the, the restaurant, too. I mean, that's part of the problem, what your clientele is like. I mean, our clientele that come to the restaurants down this area tend, as a general rule, have a very good palate. They're looking for the different. They want to see different things in the menu. And it's like, oh, you still got the summer menu on September 1st. What are you doing? Let's get the fall menu going. We want some changes. Um, so, and they're all taking the product that's coming in at, through the season. That's the fun part for us is you're, you're eating through the season. And that's our goal of work, even at home. I mean, right now, we're eating a ton of tomatoes. Um, you know, tomato soup for lunch. Today. We had tomato but... soup for lunch, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, we had cheese. We had it from um, a combination of bread. Because Sheridan's been making our own sourdough bread for mm -hmm. about four years now. Yeah. Um, from scratch, and which has been phenomenal. And then we got a local friend of ours, Tim, um, who's from, what's his name? Is it from Silence? No. So anyway, there's a local guy. He's got a small little um, bakery stuff, and he goes to the farmers markets on Saturday morning. He has Goat Island, Goat Island yeah, and he's got about probably eight to a hundred, you know, loaves of bread and buns and all that kind of stuff. And he's usually sold out within 45 minutes. Um, there's a phenomenal. If you get to, in fact, we laughed at him this Saturday. We were on the farmers market at quarter to ten. We got down a little bit later. It starts at nine o'clock, but. We got there at quarter to ten, and if I'd gotten there at ten o'clock, he would not have been there because he only had about four loaves of bread left. So we grabbed one of his seed loaves, and it was just beautiful, beautiful stuff. But that's what you go like. We've got probably eight or ten local bakers in the area, and they're making a hundred loaves of bread, you know, a week sort of thing. And they know that if they sell that, that's all they need for the week. Um, it's a different lifestyle, you know. Apparently, we love bread out here. We have so many bakers. 
It's like crazy. Who doesn't love bread? I eat. Yeah, yeah it's just, it's one of those, it's such a, we had a lady over in Bridgetown, for example, who only makes like once every week and a half, two weeks, she'll make 12 loaves of bread. Out of her house. Out of her house. But everybody just like, when she advertised it, the 12 are spoken for within like 15, 20 minutes. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's where it's, it's bad. The farm stands out here are just phenomenal. And now we get people getting more creative. I mean, you look at um, some of the ones over on the Highway 1. Yeah. Where they've got, every morning they put up, these are the breads I'm making up this morning. And I've got local spices in there that someone's making up. I've got a local hot sauce that someone's making up as well, too. Um, everyone's supporting local. It's really a big push here. We actually have enough small little um, uh, grocery stores almost that carry all local produce, meats, even some prepared meals, um, you know, ethnic meals. You can almost not have to go to a big name grocery store. You can hit two or three of these in our area and fill your, your grocery needs and never have had to step into the big grocery store, you know, which is awesome. Yeah, there's somebody from like, you know, from Digby who's making fresh sushi yeah. every day and dropping off fresh sushi at a couple of different spots around the area. Another person doing fresh Thai food. we got a great Indian restaurant just opened up over in Bridgetown and they're doing really good food. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's, we're fortunate. Yeah. It's not a big area population. I mean, the total population in this area is, you know, if I look from Bridgetown sort of just past Annapolis Royal, you're talking maybe 2,000 people, but still 100 to 125 boots at the farmer's market. And it's changed a lot. We bought 11 years ago, and most of the places, if not 95% of the places we're talking about were not around then. It was very uh, limited uh, restaurants, and the menus were very limited as well. Not a lot of adventurous cooking. And even the stores and that. And what has happened in the 11 years with a lot of new families coming uh, and them, they're starting to, you know, build that ethnic uh, diversity in our restaurants, in our shopping, and then all the new little farms. It's incredible what's happened here. Yeah. You know, Nova Scotia just hit a million uh, in population. So, what? you know, it's. Yeah, it's pretty small. I know it's. But it's, it's like Sherry Lynn says, it's true. A lot of these people who moved into the area and everybody was moving into the area predominantly because it was a nice place to live, you know, in great weather, but also because, as mentioned earlier, the real estate was so cheap that young families were moving in and saying, we're leaving Ontario, we're going to leave Alberta, we're going to leave BC, it's just it's too expensive, we can sell our place there for a lot of money. And you could buy a small farm out in this area back four or five years ago for $150,000. For COVID. Yeah. COVID. And then COVID changed everything because COVID, a lot of people just said, that's it, we're moving to Nova Scotia, getting away from the cities. And then the real estate went crazy for us, at least out here. It's not crazy compared to Alberta, BC, but, um, you know, you can still get a beautiful house out here right now for between three and $400,000 um, with land on it, some with views over the river or over the Bay of Fundy. Um, it's a great place to live. You're going to be my real estate agent, so I'm moving. <laughs> Real estate agents, we'll let them work. Yeah, we get some really good friends of ours with real estate out here. We'll let them look after you. So, yeah, and it's it's true. I mean, I when was the last time you were in Edmonton? Like 15, 20 years? No, uh, 11 years ago. We were in 2012. That was when we did the tour with the um, Engadine sessions. Um, yeah. When we came up concerts up in Edmonton. So that was yeah, 2012. That was the yeah. yeah, about 12 years ago then. So I, I mean, we've we saw our gang from Edmonton. We went to Paris together, but yeah. Yeah, but you remember the gang from Edmonton from that went up to Engadine all the time, Jerry and Leanne and the whole bit. Um, we all got together in Paris back for our... 35th wedding anniversary. Yeah, and um, had a blast. Yeah, yeah, and Edmonton's and changed a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can understand it has. We still keep in contact with a lot of people up there, but it's like every city. We go back to some of the cities now, which it's shocking to us. I mean, I remember yeah. back in the days we went back into lived in Hamilton area where there was a difference between Hamilton and then Grimsby. And now they're all just grown all together. It's just one giant metropolis. Yeah. 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 And it's a big change. And I mean, I moved back. Oh, I don't even remember. I moved back. I think I moved back in 2015 to Edmonton. Okay. Um and it was just one of those things where I'd be driving around. I was like, why does this look familiar, but also different? <laughs> and, you're just, and now it's just it's expanded and so that's why you know we 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 joke you know we got to get out of here and move but also we're kind of serious it's like i want to go but i mean jason lived in taiwan for 12 years i was all around the world as well so like you guys it, it's 
we've traveled and done a lot of other things. So yep. now it's kind of like, okay, how do we take the chocolate classes on the road yep. <laughs> and do all those things? Cause we actually, I'm doing, um, Next month, I do the, I call them harvest tasting events. So I just mm. shop at the farmer's market in the morning and then I make stuff for the evening event. And wow. it's just everything that's from the farmer's market. It's all chocolate stuff, but yep. yeah. um, it's fun and people love it because we, they'll get to try things that they would never have bought before. And they're like, exactly. oh, what is this? I'm like, it's peach juice. And then I made it to syrup and they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> what <laughs> i'm like you can do this too so but it's fun because we ended up and that's part of you know starting the podcast was i was having all these incredible conversations with people coming to these events and i've been thinking about the podcast for years and i was like we need to have these conversations in a bigger setting because people are always you know they want to know about food and i always say i don't want people to feel like oh i you know i don't shop local and i don't do this no no here's here's some options for you if you want to try it out because there's a lot of people that you know what they're just they're going to shop at Costco because that's where they're at and that is okay you've got to do what you got to do but if you want to try this I think you might yep. like it you know and, and we always eat at local we we joke that um, we have a restaurant we eat at twice a week every week um, locally owned the chef we love him he's awesome and um it's just for us, he just makes whatever he feels like that day, whatever's in season. And we're like, that's what we're eating today. <laughs> yep. Perfect. I love that. Yeah, that's... You don't have to think about it. You don't have to look at a big old menu. It's his inspiration and yay, dinner is ready. Those yeah. are usually our things we brought out to get a great chef like that, that you know, and the chef will say to you, you know, if we know the chef will just say, cook whatever you want whatever. to cook. And we love eating like that. And we're fortunate. We don't have any dietary restrictions or concerns. So for us, we're one of those couples that can walk into any restaurant, eat anything that's on the menu and never get worried about it. So we're lucky that way. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Yeah. I can eat everything except for cantaloupe. Don't even, don't even with yeah. me with cantaloupe. <laughs> and see, our, our problem is now is that we're speaking of cantaloupe. Um, we like cantaloupe a lot, but it wrecked it for us when we were living in Tuscany for a few months. Um, having cantaloupe over there just wrecks the experience here. Unless you get somebody locally and then, like we can grow, we can grow cantaloupe here. Um, which is off, you know, amazing down in the Annapolis Valley. We got friends of ours around us who grow them all the time. Our next door neighbors got one. Okay. Yeah, one mm. year. And it's so cute. It wrecks it to you after you've been in Italy and had their yeah. the freshness right off the vine. So. so different. Yeah. How long were you guys in Tuscany for? Just for a couple months. It was, it was sort of a, we had been in PEI after we left the lodge. We went to PEI to help uh, convert um, a property up in the North Shore um, in the National Park up there. And that just did not work out really well at all. Um, the owner was just not something we wanted to work for. And um, so we decided we're out of here. We don't need to do this. And um, a friend of ours from Canmore, actually, who was a regular Mount Engadine, yeah. had a cousin, I believe it was, who had a property in Tuscany, um, halfway between Florence and um, Siena. And um, we end up going, contacting her. And she said, come on over. I've got this property. It's got a vineyard. It's got uh, oh. olive, oil, olive oil, the whole bit. But she was in her 70s and wasn't really sure what to do, how to get it ready, if she wanted to sell it or anything. So we just went for two months and decided on a whim we're going to go over. And we ended up having the most amazing time. Yep. We helped her out for a couple of hours a day. And the rest of the time was sitting on her terrace. We're going for long walks into Poji Bonzi, which was the local town. And just really, the food scene there was, I mean, the farmer's market there, we were finding stuff we'd never even heard of before. I mean, Ovilo, was it Ovilo, Ovilo. Ovilo mushrooms? <laughs> You still can't say it. You still can't say it. I'm going to say olivo, but it's ovilo mushrooms. They were this beautiful white mushroom that we'd never heard of before. And Agneta, who was the owner of the property, saw them in the market one day, and I was asking her, but what are these mushrooms? She said, oh, let's get some. She got them home, and she's like literally cutting the thin slices, and drizzled the olive oil over the top, and a little bit of um, salt and pepper. And that was it, raw. And they were just, I still think about that, those mushrooms, as you can know. Yeah. We painted fences. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah, and then they had their own wines there, and she was, Agneta was just like, help yourself to all the wines you want. She said, we can't keep up with drinking them, because they didn't really sell them to anybody. They gave away 100 bottles a year to the local church, because she was quite religious. Um, but we were drinking some old, what was it, Santos, um, which is a dessert wine they do. It's a very amber dessert wine they have um, in that region of Italy. And she had some that were dating back into the 1950s for vintages. 
And she says, I'm not even sure that's any good anymore, but open up whatever you want to try it out and see the differences. And yeah, it was a lovely. She had the most amazing little wine cellar underneath her villa. Yeah. It yeah. was incredible. And it's so yeah, it was funny nice because, just, like, I love Italy. I've been a few times, but they have such a distinctive food culture between, like, even just between little towns. It's like, no, no, we eat this way and you eat that way. And I spent a Christmas there one year and, and it was traditional Christmas fair for that regions so we're up near Verona and um yeah my friend that's Italian that I'm staying with she was like yeah if you went to the next town over they would be eating some similar but there would be some differences in what they were eating and I was like I was fascinated by this concept because here I'm like doesn't everybody just eat the same thing like <laughs> yeah exactly it's like we always laugh we never realized it before but whenever I go to a restaurant now if I have to look at the menu and I see spaghetti bolognese on the menu I'm we just chuckle because the people in Bologna would be horrified that you put a Bolognese sauce with spaghetti. They, they said that was the only people in Southern Italy did that. And it was like Siena, which was the town south of where we were living in Tuscany. Um, they had a type of pasta there called Picci, um, which was native just to Siena. And it was exquisite. Incredible. Yeah. Just a really neat noodle, almost like a twist noodle, like a little bit like a routine, but just a mm. little thinner. Um, and yeah. And then Fiorentina steaks. Yeah, it was just yeah, good memories. Yeah, yeah. Well, and Panaforte, you know. like Sienna is Panaforte. Yeah, yeah. We just did a whole article on Panaforte because the first time I had it was in Sienna, and when I yeah. started looking at it, it was like, oh, this is actually this is from here. But now everybody has their own recipe, right? Yeah, yeah. We were living twenty minutes north of Sienna. It's like Portugal. What's yeah. that little tart? Yeah, the, the noche, noche, tarts of noche in Portugal, Portugal? but Portugal. Tart it's a custard little tart they make and they're known, but everybody's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. we, we went on like about a week of trying one everywhere. You know, we yeah. heard about a couple of things, ones in downtown Lisbon. So you're trying to find that hidden spot that makes the perfect one. Pate de Noche, I think it's called. It's yeah. I love food. Oh my gosh. I love food too. Um, before we end, you, you, you dangled it in front of me. Oh yeah. We met Anthony Bourdain. I need to know this. <laughs> Well, this was kind of a crazy thing that happened. This was when we were living in Tofino. Um, and so this was back in 2004. I actually had that. I brought this out just so you could see it, but I'm not sure you can read that. But Okay. Recipe waiting book, for, yeah. yeah. Waiting for Bourdain. And um, it was, we belonged to a foodie group called E Gullet, um, which I think is still in operation out on the West Coast. I don't see it very much out here. Um, but Anthony Bourdain was coming into town into Vancouver at Yale Town to sign autographs of his cookbook Les Al. Um, and so we decided, Hey, I always wanted to meet him. It'd be great. You know, let's go and spend time in Vancouver, which we always like to go anyway from Tofino. So we got into town, but beforehand, a bunch of the e Gullet group were getting together and said, Hey, let's get together a bunch of us. We all know each other. We talk on here all the time. Let's have dinner together down in Yale town. And so we did that and we got, decided to organize that. And it was at the Hamilton street grill, which I don't believe is there anymore. I think it closed down now, but it was two blocks away from the Oka's hotel where the book signing was going on. And one of the guys said to us before he went in, he said, Anthony Bourdain's a member of Egalit as well, too. So I just randomly sent out an invite to him to sort of say, hey, a bunch of us are getting together after your book signing down two blocks away. Do you want to join us? That'd be great. Of course, no response. Didn't expect a response. So we'd all gotten there. There was about a dozen of us sitting at this big, long table. They made up a special menu for us and everything like that because they all knew we were big foodies. So we'd been there for maybe 15 minutes. We, I think we just ordered our food. Yeah, I think we just ordered food because that's when he came in to order. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, who comes in the front door but Anthony Bourdain, that big, you know, big loping gate. And he comes walking right over to our table, sits down beside Sherry and I, and sort of says, so this is the gang. We said, this is the gang. And everybody was just mesmerized. And for the next hour and a half, he sat there. The owner comes rushing over right away from the restaurant. Oh, Mr. Bourdain, can we get you anything to eat, sir? And he's like, yeah, a piece of beef. 30 seconds on each side is all I want. Whatever starch you got. Yeah, make it blue and whatever starch you got in the back. It was just awesome. And he sat there for an hour and a half and told stories um, and just laughed. He got up traditional like he would at the end of his meal to go outside for a cigarette. And I don't think anybody at the table, we all smokers, got up. but everybody got up to walk outside to have a smoke with Anthony on the side of the street in downtown Yale Town. He was truly a delight. And um, yeah, we cherish that moment a lot. Yeah. It was especially in light of everything else that happened. But um, we've always been a big fan, and that was just a, such a magical dining event for us. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, yeah, I could just imagine the look on your face like, oh, oh, he's here. 
Well, we, and we've been fortunate with a lot of spots we've been in. You know, we've worked and lived in some beautiful spots. It's a very high-end resort. So we've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of very, very famous people. Um, but they're all so different and so unique. And um, it's usually the big stars we always said that are the really good ones. Like Anthony was a big star. He was a really good one. Like Robert Redford was another great guy. He was just, he'd come back into the kitchen and shake hands with all the staff at the end of the meal to thank everybody. Um, so it just. Yeah. Anthony was something though. It was like that he actually took the time out of his to come and sit with us. Yeah. We were like just gobsmacked. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And you're, you're very right, Chris. Like I worked in Vegas, so we had celebrities all the time come to where yeah. I was working. And yeah, it was like sometimes the biggest stars were so humble and they were just like, thank you so much for doing this. And you're like, you're welcome. <laughs> You know, I, I, I put myself out here. <laughs> I, mean, what, like, I think I mentioned to you when we were out in the Rockies that I had this idea I've been trying to do for years um, with a t-shirt line. And I ended up doing it when we came to Nova Scotia. Yeah. And it was um, I think an idea I had for about 20 years now. It was called Foodism, the new religion. But it was spelled like Buddhism, but F-U-U-D-H-I-S-M. And then what I did is I took passages from the Bible and did a little twist on them. And so the first two that I, I put out so five years ago, mm -hmm. were um, the leeks shall inherit the earth, and blessed are the pizza labels. And um, it was great. The logo on the front actually shows a um, plate with a crossed cross on it, but the cross is with a fork and a spoon. So oh it was my a gosh. nice, real good play and everything. We had a lot of fun with that. It was just same thing, that food background again, always doing something with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Well, I can't wait to see what your fall harvest is like. Because, uh, yeah, I, yeah you're, like I said, your garden is still going strong. Uh, going crazy. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it was such a pleasure. Thanks for reaching out and say hi to your parents for us. I absolutely will. I'm going to see them today. I need marshmallow sticks from them. I'm going, yeah. tomorrow I'm going to a cabin. I know, it's a random. I'm going to a cabin in the woods tomorrow with my bestie. And we are, no cell phones, nothing. We're reading books. Awesome. All we're doing. Excellent. That sounds perfect. Thank yes. you. Enjoy. Well deserved. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to. Well, we will continue on uh, chatting for another second. But thank you for coming today. I'm just thrilled that we got to reconnect after so many years. Like I said, being up at Mount Engadine with you guys and um, all the people that were there, I'm still in touch with many of them. Like you said, you, you just end up making these friendships. So it was a big family. It was a big family there. That's what we always loved about Mangadine. It was just a magical place. It absolutely was. It absolutely was. So thank you so much. And uh, we will talk to you again soon. It was so fun to catch up with Chris and Sherry Lynn. What a great conversation. Stay tuned for next week as we'll have more on the Food Explorer podcast. Thanks.